So what we're seeing now is that it cannot be locked down and cannot be dealt with the same way as the SARS virus was dealt with and stopped. It will continue to spread. And the question is to what extent and how long will it continue to spread? So are you saying that there's really no um, evidence base for these lockdowns? That's what I'm saying. I don't know any single country in Europe that had any idea how they would get out of the lockdown. The exit strategy was never discussed. So I was saying to myself, when country after country uh, did or took up different restrictions, how are they going to get out of there? Have they even thought about that? But I don't think anyone did when, when the lockdowns started. So what will happen is after the two or three weeks that governments have agreed to a lockdown, they will reassess, do another risk assessment and see where they stand and make further recommendations at that time. But this is not a process which can be an on off process. We can't be sure that after three weeks, everything will be back to normal because it will not be. The lesson from this so far is that the countries that move quickly have done better. The countries that at, in January or February, you might have said are overreacting. The ability uh, of people to think as a community rather than always to think as individuals. That to me has been the unique and defining feature of this, of success versus lack of success. Regardless of the politics, regardless of the regime, regardless of the social contract, we've seen it in left-leaning, right-leaning, all over the world, where communities, uh, individuals, have sublimated their individual needs over the community's benefit. But communities can do a lot of magic in terms of the way they support each other uh, through a crisis. Uh, and we, we haven't. And maybe in, 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 in the wealthy North and West, we've forgotten how to leverage the power of community. And we see the community as an obstacle to implementation. The community as the resistant ones, not the community as the center of success. So it also shows you how incredibly intersectoral uh, this uh, whole issue is, how quickly viruses become political and how they actually don't only affect the economy, they affect security matters and uh, a whole range of other very, very uh, difficult issues to resolve that definitely cannot be resolved in the World Health Organization. Uh, you have to do things at scale as recovery and solidarity have done and small trials will often be unhelpful and will often be politicized as we've seen in this epidemic where politicians sadly uh, made statements about certain drugs which proved not to be true and I think delayed and uh, uh, slowed down our progress in developing treatments. Although the research community may not have been seen as some of the frontline workers in the response to this pandemic, they actually have been frontline workers. And I've never seen the scientific community respond to a health, health threat in the way that they've responded to this. It has been absolutely remarkable. Global health diplomacy and science diplomacy are coming together more and more that you know, the international cooperation of scientific institutions, of researchers, of innovators is becoming so critical as we want to develop and uh, develop vaccines, diagnostics and therapeutics. And therefore that coming together of the health diplomacy side and the science diplomacy side will be critical, particularly as uh, some countries uh, definitely would prefer that you know, certain uh, scientific results would first uh, be available to uh, themselves only initially rather than sharing. And I think the greatest challenge to global health diplomacy right now is to make sure that the vaccines, diagnostics and therapeutics become a global public good. Equitable access for us means that it gets out to developed and developing countries at the same time, and that the portfolio is shared among all countries. Of course, practically speaking, this will be the largest um, rollout of vaccines in history, and therefore it doesn't mean that every single person everywhere in the world is going to get it at the same time, but that what we're doing is changing the strategy globally to try to make this happen. We are... Um very optimistic, a much more equitable 
approach. There will still be problems, though, with those kinds of uh, circumstances that we can't change. But this is a leap ahead uh, of huge proportion. If vaccine induced immunity was not long lasting and the virus continued to circulate, we would be on a on a track of flu vaccine equivalent, but worse, because every single year or whatever frequency, we would have to be doing this over and over and over again. And if you think about flu vaccine programs, at the moment, they are done pretty much only in high income and some middle income countries. They are not done in low income countries. Uh, and by and large, they are not well delivered. So if we find ourselves on the same track with a coronavirus, I see this as being potentially a very difficult long haul. Do you think one of the challenges um, in the immediate future is that maybe with this vaccine arriving, we might collapse into yeah. complacency and just come say, oh, well, the cavalry's arrived. No. <laughs> um, we can relax. Is that a I danger? Think, yeah. and, and what are you going to do about that? <laughs> I think the opposite, Emma, I really do. I think the message that I've been giving now, uh, ever since it became clear a few days ago that we have a, a really quite effective vaccine getting ready to deploy, is rather than, hey, don't worry, you're okay, it's that don't stop shooting. The cavalry is coming, but don't put your weapons down. <laughs> you better keep fighting because they're not here yet. Help is on the way but it isn't here yet. So to me, that's more of an incentive of, please don't give up, don't despair. The end is in sight as opposed to, hey, we're good to go, don't worry about anything. We're not good to go. We've got to continue to double down on public health measures. You know, Emma, what's important is that our political leaders start to talk realistically about what is and is not possible with a vaccine.